Okay, so welcome to the third day of the Strings Conference, everybody. Um, please take your seats. Um, the first session will be chaired by Miriam Cvetic, and uh, over to you, Miriam. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the first session of the third day of the conference. Uh, there will be two announcements at the end of the session, but I think we should start promptly with the first speaker. Uh, this is Dan Waldrum from Imperial College, and he will talk about developments in generalized geometry. Thank Dan, you. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the organizers for the chance to speak, and also, as others have said, for the organization of this meeting. It's really great to be here in person. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to start with some probably superfluous motivation. So um, geometrical backgrounds are ubiquitous in string theory. Uh, they're important for phenomenology, for the swampland, for holography. And in the case when we have uh, no non-trivial fluxes, we have many tools for thinking about that geometry. The geometry might be a lead group, it might be a coset space, it might be a space in particular a special holonomy, a calabi yau manifold or a G2 manifold. It's a Zaki Einstein in the case of uh, holography. And from those tools, we can do things, calculate things that we want, like the moduli, the spectrum uh, of uh, dual to the operators in, in, in the holography, for example. We might even have theorems about existence of solutions in the case of Calabi Yau. So the question that we want to talk about today is what about when there are large non-trivial fluxes? And when I say large, I mean don't think of them as a small perturbation about calabi but the size of the flux is comparable to the curvature. And exceptional generalized geometry, I apologize for the name, things cannot be both exceptional and general, and general but anyway, um, is a framework to extend the standard geometrical constructions to include fluxes. So, um, and it builds on a long history of using G-structures and generalized complex geometry. So in a way, my talk today is an applications talk. I'm going to tell you about something in supergravity, and then there's many applications for it. I feel a little bit like I'm at LHC, and I'm giving you the talk about the, the trigger rather than what the mass of the Higgs is, but I hope I will show you along the way that from this formulation, we can calculate things that we couldn't calculate before. And I was asked to review in particular uh, the uh, applications to holography and also something called consistent truncations, which I'll describe. And let me apologize in advance that there are many important uh, applications that I don't get to mention or I'll just mention in passing. It doesn't mean they're not wonderful applications, it just means I couldn't fit them in and I had to make the talk somewhat coherent. Um, so let me just start by thanking my collaborators over this work that's gone on for several years. Um, in particular, there are, I've had a number of fantastic PhD students who I've learned from, and I just wanted to mention one of them, who's Ed Tasker, who very sadly died just over two uh, years ago, very unexpectedly. Um, he was a wonderful student, and I miss him a great deal, and I'd like to dedicate this talk to him. So I'll try and do uh, four things. I'll start by just describing to you what exceptional generalized geometry is, since it may not be familiar to all of you. I'll then talk about an application to supersymmetry, and we'll see how we can use it to describe supersymmetric backgrounds. I'll then talk about consistent truncations. Uh, in the supersymmetric backgrounds, we'll see how to calculate some moduli of flux backgrounds we couldn't before. Um, then I'll talk about consistent truncations, and we'll understand how to understand spectra in particular. And then I'll talk about holography, and there I'll be a little bit more detailed about a particular problem, which is understanding the uh, marginal deformations of uh, supersymmetric backgrounds. Okay, so first, exceptional generalized geometry, and a little bit of just framework for what I'm talking about. We're always going to be thinking about some compactification, so there's some space which has an external space X and an internal space M, and I'll have two pictures sometimes. Sometimes I'll be on shell, meaning I satisfy the equations of motion of the supergravity, and then X will either be a Minkowski or an ADS space. I'll allow it to be warped, and we'll have some fluxes on the internal internal space, uh, and as you know, there are famous no-go theorems in the case of Minkowski that these fluxes have to have sources. In the ADS, of course, it's fine. Uh, I'll also have an off-shell formulation sometimes, which is where I'm just trying to write some theory in, in, the, uh, in the external space. And in fact, you could take the whole theory in the higher dimensions and just reformulate it as though it was a theory in the external space. Then you'll have an infinite number of scalar fields, an infinite number of vector fields, and so on. But you can think about it that way, and sometimes that's a useful way of thinking about where things like supersymmetry conditions come from. Other times, we want to actually truncate to some subset of modes on this space, some subset of modes on the on Kaluza Klein modes on the internal space, and uh, write a theory for those modes. Okay. 
So what's generalized geometry? So let me start with the simplest case. Suppose we just focus at the Neverschwartz, Neverschwartz fields of, uh, of type 2. We have two types of symmetries. We have diffeomorphisms generated by vectors and gauge transformations generated by a one form. They form some algebra. Um, and we can package those degrees of freedom, those, those symmetries, into a larger vector called a generalized vector that's just twice as big. It's just a combination of vectors and one forms. And note the algebra of the gauge transformations doesn't fix what the, what the new one form is because it's only the exterior derivative that appears there. But we can choose a particular integration of this to define something called the generalized Lie derivative. So this is somehow capturing both the gauge trans, both the diffeomorphisms and the gauge transformations. And you notice here already it's not symmetric between uh, the two generalized vectors, actually, at this point, unlike the Lie bracket. This i, I just mean the contraction with the vector. So why do you choose that? The reason you choose that particular combination is that it preserves the natural metric on this generalized tangent space. So there's a natural metric where you just contract the vectors into the one forms. That's an ODD metric. You can think of the vectors in one forms as being like uh, time-like directions. And this generalized Lie derivative extends to uh, this object, and you find that it's, it's, it's uh, invariant. So that means we can actually extend this generalized Lie derivative to any representation of this ODD group. So we can define the analog of ordinary tensors as generalized tensors, which are just representations of this orthogonal group. We slightly enlarge it to include the dilaton. So we allow things which are also weighted by powers of the determinant bundle. So that's just like densities. Um, of course, in here, there's a general linear group. When you do that decomposition, it just gives you the decomposition into ordinary tensors. And the basic idea of generalized geometry is that by doing this, we geometrize the flux, in this case, the never schwartz never schwartz flux. And the idea is we want to reformulate supergravity and supersymmetric backgrounds geometries in terms of these generalized tensors. That's the basic thing that we're trying to do. So that was ODD generalized geometry. Uh, so let me give an example of what you can do there. So for example, you could try and do Riemannian geometry. There we want to choose some generalized metric different from the ODD metric that I just talked about. What's the natural way to think about this metric? Well, in ordinary geometry, the metric is invariant under OD, which is the maximally compact subgroup of GLD. So the natural thing here is to choose the thing that's invariant under the maximally compact subgroup, which is OD times OD. When you do that, you find that this metric is parameterized in a very familiar way that's familiar from T-duality. It encodes just the fields of the never schwartz sector, including the dilaton, if we allow it to have this weight. So if you want to do Riemannian geometry, you want to try and do the analog of the levi chavita connection. So we want some connection that preserves this metric and is also torsion-free. But this is a generalized connection. That's not quite the same as an ordinary connection because we can take derivatives along the vector and also along the one form. So along the vector direction, it looks like an ordinary ODD connection. But there's also this extra tense of it sitting here. And you can define a notion of torsion using the generalized Lie derivative effectively. And again, it appears in certain representations different from the case in, in, in ordinary geometry. And what you find when you look for this generalized levi civita connection, you find you don't get a single one, but you get a family. However, if you calculate the corresponding Ricci tensor for each element of that family, you get the same answer. So the Ricci tensor is unique, and the Ricci tensor captures the never schwartz never schwartz equations of motion. So if you just set the Ricci to generalized Ricci tensor to zero, that corresponds to the equations of motion for G, phi, and H. Or equivalently, you can write down the action using the generalized Ricci scalar. If you wanted to extend into the rest of the type 2 theory, you might ask about the Ramon Ramon fields. They form ODD spinner representations, which are the same as polyforms, sums of odd or even forms. And the fermions become representations of the maximally compact subgroup as in ordinary geometry. So that's the ODD story. What about the, ex the exceptional story? So the obvious question is, how do you extend this to the Ramon Ramon sector, or equivalently to M theory? So let's talk about the M theory case. So in M theory, we have a four-form flux. We have a dual seven-form flux that's formulated in terms of both, with potentials A and A tilde. And now I have transformations that are diffeomorphisms, two-form gauge transformations, and five-form gauge transformations. For definiteless, let's focus, focus on the case we're in six dimensions. So I'm always doing the geometry on the internal space, so the internal space is six-dimensional. 
Now the generalized tangent space becomes vectors two forms and five forms. There's a corresponding generalized Lie Li derivative. I'm just writing as a sum of objects here, right, rather than writing out the column vector. Um, and remarkably, this generalized Lie derivative, provided you choose the right integration, uh, preserves now an E6 invariant. So this generalized tangent space is 27 dimensional, and there's a natural E6 invariant, a cubic invariant you can write on that 27 dimensional representation, and this generalized Lie derivative preserves that representation. So now we can think about generalized tensors, but they're going to be representations of the exceptional group rather than the ODD group. And note this is the this is the split form of the exceptional group. So we had the split form of the ODD group, now we have the split form of the exceptional group. You can again write down a generalized metric. It's preserved under the maximally compact subgroup, the USP8 group, again familiar from U-duality. Um, and again, if you write down bosonic supergravity on the internal space, it just corresponds to generalized Einstein theory. The fermions become representations of this local symmetry, compact group. That was the M-theory case. Um, you can also do type 2b. All that changes is we choose a different GLD subgroup in order to decompose the exceptional group. The tangent generalized tangent space then gets different combinations of, of, of ordinary tensors, so vectors, a pair of one forms, three forms, and a pair of five forms. You can just think of these as the corresponding brains, right? The, uh, momentum, uh, D and F string, and so on. And you can also extend to other dimensions, and in general, the way I'm going to describe it, we can go up to the seven-dimensional case. So that's the idea. Um, that's the basic formalism. You, you, you can extend this formalism in various ways. Um, I just described how the generalized metric worked from the point of view of the off-shell theory. If I think about the full theory, 11-dimensional theory, that's basically telling you about the scalars from the point of view of the external space. You can extend this and also include vectors. They also form representations of the, of the exceptional group. Uh, there's a corresponding description of the heterotic case. And I should say, so there's also a formalism that goes under the name of double field theory, or exceptional field theory, that started by, with Harlan Spiebach, thinking about uh, the geometry of strings on uh, tori and trying to keep uh, both the um, momentum and winding modes. And in that case, what you do is you imagine extending the space-time. So instead of just extending the tangent space, which is the way I described it, you think of a larger dimensional space-time, where the extended span tangent space just becomes the tangent space of the larger space-time. Now, there's lots of interesting questions about how that works on Tori and trying to understand, for example, it can describe backgrounds which are patched by uh, U-dualities. There's questions about whether you can think of it as a, that it appears as a consistent truncation of the string field theory. You can also try and do it on more general spaces, and typically then what one does is just say, in fact, that you assume that it's independent of some large number of the, of the extra, extra dimensions, so that effectively it becomes the same formalism as the one I've described, at least locally. So I only want to mention it because some of the results I'm saying I, I described were first done in this exceptional field theory case, some was first done in the, in the exceptional generalized geometry, but locally it's, it's exactly the same calculations. You can ask about going beyond D equals seven, there are ways of doing that. What happens is that you have to start thinking about the dual graviton there, and it sort of starts messing up the generalized Lie derivative, though there are interesting ways in trying to deal with that. So again, I won't have time to talk about it. Um, a very obvious thing you might try and do once you've got this formalism is to try and think about higher derivative corrections, because maybe the structure of the symmetries is going to constrain, for example, the completion, the flux completion of out of the fourth terms. Uh, it turns out that that seems to be difficult. It seems to be that what one needs to do when you start doing alpha prime corrections or doing corrections in M theory is you actually have to modify the generalized Lie derivative. But again, there's lots of interesting work in that direction, and again, I apologize that I won't have time to talk about it. And finally, you might ask, why is it that this structure is appearing? So, in a way, uh, it's not very deep. Whenever you have a theory which has... Uh, so, mathematically, these objects I'm talking about are called algebroids. Um, it's very natural to get an algebroid whenever you have a theory with diffeomorphisms and other symmetries. It will naturally combine into an algebroid. The interesting thing here is that it's an algebraic with some extra structure that it had this group, this, this group act. It preserved this, uh, this larger structure group. And you can generalize the notion of algebraic to something called a G-algebraic, which sort of has that extra structure. It's interesting to try and understand what those things are. And more generally, as I mentioned, you can think of this 
uh, these theories as being some remnants of some descent, some descent of the uh, infinity symmetry of closed string field theory. And there are papers which have looked at how to integrate out the closed string fields to understand how that arises. The L infinity symmetry is a very floppy one, so I think actually there's something about the fact that it preserves this extra G structure, which might be interesting to try and understand uh, a little more about what these symmetries are. Okay, so that's the background. So now I'm going to turn to start talking about applications, and the first one I want to talk about is about supersymmetry. So. Um, as you know, a supersymmetric background in general gives you some structure on the internal space. So it gives you some new geometrical structure beyond the metric. It might give you some symplectic structure or Kähler structure or something. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about those geometrical structures and just remind you about G structures. So let's take the example of a complex structure. So a complex structure has two bits to it. The first is a sort of topological condition. That's the existence of an almost complex structure. You can think of it as the existence of a global tensor, mixed index tensor that squares to minus one. Equivalently, you can think of it as a decomposition of the complexification of the tangent space into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic bits. And it's a topological restriction because the, the structure group, the way that the tangent bundle is patched, is getting reduced. It just lives in the complex subgroup of the general linear group. And then there's a differential condition, and it, what gives you an integrable complex structure, and that you can think about in lots of different ways. The classic way to think about it is says that this sub-bundle is involutive. If I take the Lie bracket between two vectors in here, I get something in here. You can also rephrase it as the vanishing of the Nienhaus tensor. That's some derivatives of the, of the uh, global tensor. Or there's another way of saying it, which is the G-structure way of thinking about it, which is that this is equivalent to saying there exists a connection which is both compatible, the derivative of the, uh, of the complex, almost complex structure is zero, and also is torsion-free, its torsion vanishes. And this way of thinking about it allows you to generalize to lots of other examples, so it's sort of a useful formalism. Levi right, the Levi-Civita connection is an example of this for the case where the structure was just the orthogonal group. Um, so how does this help us with supersymmetric backgrounds? So, um, in general, you, for a, you want to solve the killing spinner equation. You have some Levi-Civita derivative and some flux acting on the spinner. And uh, if there's no flux, you know very well that this leads you to special holonomy, and you can think of those as integrable G structures where G is a subgroup of the, of the orthogonal group. So for example, if it was SUN, it was Calabi-Yau, the structure's defined by the Kähler form and the holomorphic N form. If it was uh, G2, it's defined by some particular three form. And then the integrability conditions become differential conditions on these, on these objects that define the structure, and they're closed. So the f these are closed, and the three form is closed and co-closed. What if you turn on flux? Well, the classic way of thinking about that from uh, 20 years ago is that you should then think about that as defining not an integrable structure, but a non-integrable structure. Strictly, it also becomes only local. The structure may change as you move around the manifold. So now the forms, the structure forms here are no longer closed, but they have a flux on the right-hand side. And you can think about that as something called the intrinsic torsion. So I told you that you thought about G-structures, uh, integrable G-structures as the existence of a connection which was compatible and torsion free. So if you want to find one that has vanishing torsion, you want to vary within this set of connections and try and find one that has zero torsion. If there's some bit of the torsion you can never get rid of, that's the intrinsic torsion. It's intrinsic to the structure and it captures the lack of integrability. And this has been a very useful way of classifying backgrounds, of finding new solutions, but problems like moduli is hard because essentially you don't have integrable structures. Now, this was extended again almost 20 years ago to the type 2K in the type 2 case by doing ODD generalized geometry. So the classic example, this started with Hitchin and Galtieri and generalized complex structures. And then the classic example extends the calabi yau case. You get two generalized structures. These are things that are, these are actually ODD spinners. One of them is integrable and closed, but if you have ramon ramon fluxes, the other one is not. So again, that geometrizes the never schwartz flux, but not quite the ramon ramon flux. So I think you can see where I'm going. The obvious question now is, what if you try and geometrize everything? Does it all become integrable? And it turns out there is a theorem which says that it does. So what is a generalized G-structure? That's now something, some G-structure, where G is now a subgroup of the exceptional group. We can think of it as defined by a set of invariant generalized tensors. And there's a result, which is that if you have a completely generic supersymmetric flux background, an M-theory or type 2, 
uh, where the compact space is uh, seven-dimensional or less. Um, that's equivalent to, in the Minkowski space, you have an integrable exceptional complex structure. And in the ADS case, you have one which has a little bit of torsion. It has a singlet intrinsic torsion. That's what sometimes gets called in the ordinary literature a weak holonomy. So it's almost integrable. It's just got this one bit of torsion, and it's a singlet. It transforms trivially under the structure group. And the structure group you get is one that stabilizes the, the killing spinners that you're interested in. So, for example, in uh, D equals 4, um, the supersymmetry parameter transforms, so that's, we're in E7, because it's a compact seven-dimensional space in M-theory. The corresponding maximally compact subgroup is SU8, and the spinner transforms in at 8 of that SU8. If I have a single spinner, it's stabilized by SU7, so the group here is SU7. If I have a pair, it's SU6, and so the group here is SU6, and so on. So you should think of these things as the analog of special holonomy when you have the fluxes turned on. It's an interesting question whether you can think of them in terms of holonomy. Um, and from this formulation, we find that we can first we can classify backgrounds, we can also find new solutions, as I'm going to talk about, and in particular, we can calculate moduli, solving problems that we couldn't do easily when we formulated things the other way. So let me focus on a particular example to show you how the moduli arise. So let's try and generalize G2. So let's try and think about a background which has uh, general fluxes compactifying M theory to four dimensions, preserving a single supersymmetry. So from what I just told you, that means we need some SU7 structure. And it turns out that the corresponding invariant tensor is something that lives in the 912 representation. Don't worry. It's some object. When I decompose this representation, it has uh, um, scalars in it, some three forms, and then some six index things, and so on. And just to say, if you imagine that you had an ordinary uh, G2 uh, structure, you could put uh, a constant in here, you could put the G2 structure three form in here, you could put a pair of G2 structures here with six indices and so on, and that's exactly how it works. So this actually has to live in some particular orbit in the 912, and that in the G2 case, you then this could become some nonlinear expression in terms of the G2 structure. Now, if we view this in the off-shell point of view, we can think of this as a four-dimensional theory with uh, n equal one supersymmetry, and this, this structure you could, is just the scalar fields as part of chiral matter. So you would expect, if I think about it as reforming the 11-dimensional theory, there was a theory in four dimensions with an infinite number of degrees of freedom. Um, it would have an infinite, dimension, infinite number of chiral matter from all the occlutzer climb modes, but there should be some Kähler metric on that, on, that, on that space. And indeed, there is. So if you look at the space of structures, you find that there's a infinite dimensional, it's an infinite dimensional space and there's a Kähler metric on it. So now you can think about the supersymmetry, and you'd expect from the point of view of the lower dimensional theory there'd be two, two terms. One would be an F term, and the other one would be a D term. So the F term would follow from a superpotential. You can indeed write a superpotential for this. But another way of thinking about it is that it actually just defines an involutive subbundle. So again, we can take the generalized tangent space and decompose it under this SU7 subgroup, and you get a seven-dimensional sub-bundle sub here. This is like the decomposition into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. And again, this has to be closed under the generalized Lie derivative. In fact, this thing forms a Lie algebraid. Then there are D terms, and D terms should come from symmetries acting on the Kähler space, and they should correspond to moment maps. So what's the symmetry group we have? Well, the symmetry group we have is the symmetry of diffeomorphisms and gauge transformations. Let's just call that generalized diffeomorphisms, for give it a name. And that acts on this structure just by the generalized Lie derivative, and it preserves the Kähler metric. So the D terms are actually just moment maps for the action of this generalized diffeomorphism symmetry. That's going to be parameterized by vectors, generalized vectors, because they do the infinitesimal transformations. So there'll be some moment maps for each vector has to vanish. OK. So this picture is actually very uh, generic when you have supersymmetric uh, equations. And um, it's 
right? Because you typically have first some set of F, F term conditions, which are holomorphic. And actually, if you solve those conditions, you'll still get a Kähler manifold. And then you're left with some moment map and you want to find solutions where in this space where you're living on the moment map equal to zero. And then you mod out by the gauge transformation. So you really have a symplectic quotient. And when you take the symplectic quotient, you still get a Kähler space. But if you're doing this on a Kähler manifold, there's actually two different pictures that can go on. You can think of it as a symplectic quotient, or you can also think of it in the language of geometrical invariant theory. And that says, instead of actually finding the solution where mu equals zero, you can just take a point away from that and then act by the complexified gauge group. And that should generically intersect this, this line. So if you think about the orbits of these things, that's roughly the same as finding the solutions. Sometimes they don't intersect. If, it, if they do intersect, this is called a stable point. If it doesn't intersect, it's, a, it's an unstable point. And sometimes it's easier to solve the problem not by finding the solution of this equation, which will be a differential equation in our case, but instead by trying to put conditions to discover when these points are stable. And those are algebraic things. So that way of doing things has been used, as I'm sure many of you know, has been used in many different cases for hermitian yang mills equations, for thinking about uh, kalabi yau manifolds, Kähler-Einstein metrics, and, and, and Suzaki einstein metrics. This goes back to the work of uh, Yao, Tian, and Donaldson. So we have the same situation here, um, except our group is the generalized diffeomorphism group. And that fact allows us to calculate the moduli in a very easy way, because rather than actually having to solve as we move a little bit here where the moment map vanishes, we can actually just quotient out by the complexified gauge group. And what happens is that this involutive structure defines a complex. Because it was a Lie algebraid, you get some complex with some differential d. And when you deform this uh, structure that's determining the background, and I should say I've ignored the fluxes, so I'm assuming I have some background with some sources. When I do this deformation, let's not deform the sources, and let's assume the deformation uh, remains small as you go through the source. If you make those assumptions, then the local moduli space is just counted by the cohomology of this complex. And furthermore, you can show that that cohomology is actually just the same as the Duram cohomology. So if you think about this, um, this is actually the same as G2. So although I've got fluxes in the background, I'm getting the same local moduli space. For G2, right, I deform phi, that deforms in some third cohomology. I can also deform the gauge potential A, that complexifies this, and the sixth cohomology vanishes on a G2 manifold. So we can find the moduli for these backgrounds. They combine metric and gauge fields in complicated ways. That's great. The problem is we don't have good flux examples for which I'm calculating the moduli for. So if you gave me one, this is the moduli. However, you can use the same formulation to think about type 2, and in particular these Granier, Manassian, Tomasiello, Petrini backgrounds. And there, uh, you, you follow through the same way. You can decompose it into some other. Uh, you can, you can um, show that this cohomology is equivalent, the, the, this complex cohomology of this complex is equivalent to something else you can calculate. And for example, you can check various things like the fact that the moduli of the Granier Porchinsky background actually matches what you, the naive superpotential expe expectation is. Okay, so what else can you do? So you can extend this to um, other dimensions. You can think about this in, um, uh, with quarter supersymmetry. That's what we call exceptional Calabi Yau. Uh, again, you can find some moduli. You can do half supersymmetry. You can do it for the heterotic hull Strominger system. And again, think about the moduli in terms of this picture. Um, some other interesting things, the Kähler potential on this infinite dimensional space of structures actually defines a kind of Hitchin functional. If you know about G2s, there's a functional you can define in terms of the G2 structure, and extremizing that functional under the, sp under the set of closed forms puts you on the G2 structure. Um, here we get some exceptional extension of that, which, if you like, includes the fluxes in M theory or includes the ramon ramon fields in, in type 2. Um, so um, you might ask, as, uh, these Hitchin functionals are supposed to be are the target space theories for topological theories, topological theories when you do it in the Neva-Schwartz sector. So you might ask what happens when you quantize these things. Um, and then, of course, a bigger question, and one I don't have a huge amount to say, is whether you can use this picture, so this, this uh, 
This picture of stability is the way that the existence of solutions of, um, of um, Kähler-Einstein manifolds and so on have, have been shown. So you might ask if we got the same framework, whether we can some, somehow start moving to have some proofs about the existence of solutions. And I'll only say here that there's already a bit of a notion in, in the mass literature about whether if you take closed G2 forms, whether if you vary within that cohomology class, there'll always be a co-closed one. There isn't one, but you can show that that's not true. But this, this would fit exactly into the stability picture that I'm talking about. Um, and in particular, because there is no, if you have no, no, no um, sources, you can't have flux on a compact space. It will have to put you on the G2 case. You might also wonder about toric backgrounds because if you have enough symmetries, it's sometimes easy to check about the uh, stability conditions. Okay, so I now want to change gear and I want to talk about consistent truncations, which is a different application. Um, so what is a, what, what's the idea of consistent truncations? The idea is that if you have a theory, you can truncate it to some subset of modes and the solutions of the subset of modes is automatically solutions of the full theory. So let me just give you a very trivial example. If I have two scalar fields with this cubic coupling, you notice that pi sources both phi and pi, whereas phi only sources, um, only sources pi. So if I turn off pi, uh, I'm automatically satisfying its own equation of motion and I get a consistent truncation to just phi. However, if I turn off phi, um, I don't get a consistent truncation precisely because pi sources phi. And uh, that's true even if there's a difference in mass scales. So, of course, you might be able, you could write an effective theory when the masses are very different, but if you really want classically every solution down in the truncated theory to be a solution upstairs, uh, you, you, can't do the, you can't truncate to pi. And there's a symmetry reason here, which is simply that there's a Z2 symmetry, which is the reflection in pi, and we're just keeping all the singlets under this Z2. So, Typically, we want to be interested in the case where these fields are coming from a kaluza klein modes on a compactification. And why should you care about this? Well, there's a long history of using these consistent truncated theories uh, to give uplifts. So you may be able to find solutions in the truncated theory that you then know will automatically be solutions upstairs. And that's been done in lots of different examples. In holography, in the large end limit, this uh, truncation is forming some closed sector under the OPE. And as we're going to see, so you could also check things like stability. So if you have, say, a uh, non-supersymmetric ADS background, you might check whether it's stable for the fluctuations under these modes, which is a sort of partial check of things like the ADS Swampland conjecture. And we'll come back to that later on. All right, so there's a long history of looking for these suitable ansatz. The basic one is the Schirk-Schwartz one, where you just assume the internal space is a group manifold and you expand in terms of left invariant objects. And there it's the symmetry of the left invariance, which means that, uh, means that you can't, you, you don't source, if you only keep singlets, you're not sourcing anything that's uh, charged, so it's necessarily um, a consistent truncation. This will give you a theory of maximal supersymmetry. Then there are these mysterious sphere compactifications that are known from the late 80s, originally, um, which don't have uh, any obvious reason that they um, give you a consistent truncation. You have to take a very complicated ansatz that mixes the metric and gauge fields. And then more generally, you can take a conventional G-structure and just keep things that are with a constant singlet torsion and keep everything that's invariant under the structure. And again, that symmetry reason means that you'll get a consistent truncation. So what about the general picture? Well, we just put this into generalized, exceptional generalized geometry. And the, uh, again, there's a theorem which says that given a generalized G-structure on M with constant singlet intrinsic torsion, if you keep all the G-invariant fields, this gives a consistent truncation on M theory or type 2. And in fact, that includes the Schirk-Schwartz. If you like, you can think of that as an identity structure, a trivial structure, and you're just keeping things that are invariant under that trivial structure. It's parallelizable. So, the classic case there is this a generalized Schirk-Schwartz. So again, that's the case where we take a trivial structure. The generalized tangent space is parallelizable. I can find a global frame for it, a basis. And singlet torsion just means when I take the generalized Lie derivative here, I just get some constants, these x. Now, in the um, ordinary Schirk-Schwartz, this defines the Lie algebra. Here, it's not a Lie algebra, it's a Leibniz algebra. But it has a... Um, Ideal, and if you quotient by the ideal, you get a you get a Lie algebra, and the manifold here is just a, always has to be a coset space based on this on this Lie algebra. And again, you expand everything using these this general basis. 
And that includes these mysterious spheres. So although these spheres like S4 are not ordinary parallelizable, they are generalized parallelizable. So the places where the vector component vanishes, some other form component doesn't vanish, so you get a global frame. So the, this, this picture explains the existence of these uh, sphere compactifications, uh, sphere reductions. And in general, you'll get some gauge supergravity with some embedding tensor. And there's a long history of people doing this generalized Schwartz reduction. So let me just briefly mention some developments in the way this is these, uh, pic this, these formalism works. So you can use this formalism to prove the full consistency of the S5 truncation that was, strictly speaking, missing. You can reduce the generalized Schwartz to a purely algebraic problem, and that allows you to classify all, for example, the compact simple gaugings, and they're just the ones that come from these spheres. You can also define the notion of non-abelian or poisson lee u-duality, so the analog of poisson lee t-duality, and in this picture, this is just two different generalized parallelizations on different spaces that give the same algebra. In particular, you can use this formalism to start mapping out the possible landscape of, um, ex of uh, consistent truncations. So, in particular, um, you can look, uh, you can show that uh, there were this discovery of a family of SO8 gaugings of unequal eight supergravity. You can show that actually only the old ones actually come from consistent truncations, although some other dionic gaugings are possible you can actually classify all the possible consistent truncations you could get in uh, for quarter maximal or half maximal supersymmetry up to some uh, uh, not, f not fully classifying, but doing a sort of three quarters of the classification. You have a question at the end about whether you can find a suitable frame, but at least excludes a whole lot of things. There may be some may exclude further when you do the full derivation. And you can also prove a, a, a conjecture of uh, Gordon Tavarella, which said that there should always be a pure, pure supergravity truncation whenever you have an ADS background. And you can extend to higher dimensions, and there's many other cases that I'm not managed, that I don't have time to talk about. Okay, but I want to address something else, which is what this only looked at a particular set of fields in the truncation. What if you tried to do everything? What if you tried to get the complete spectrum? A priori, that looks extremely difficult. You may have some very complicated internal space, and it would seem very hard to find all the eigenmodes. But there's some lovely work by Malik and Sundleben, which shows that, in fact, you can do it in this generalized, in this picture of uh, consistent truncations. So here's a consistent truncation, and uh, in general, there's some particular potential for the scalars in the truncation, and that will have several ADS minima. So here I've drawn it for a sphere, here's the sphere one, but there's also one that might be deformed. Now the fact that the internal space is a coset, you can always decompose fluctuations into representations of SOD plus one, but they're only going to be eigenstates of the, uh, they're only going to be, um, give you, the, give you the, sp the spectrum when you're on the, on the round sphere. So you can do the same decomposition here, but it won't necessarily be related to the spectrum. But what's interesting is that if this movement here is just in the, in the modes, the consistent truncation modes, you find that the mass matrix here is just algebraic. It just depends on the representation, where the values of the modes are here, and this thing that controlled the algebra. And so from that, you can actually calculate the full spectrum at any extremum. And if it's supersymmetric, this comes naturally in BPS multiplets. And this includes cases that have no isometries at all, which a priori would seem in, uh, impossible to calculate the spectrum. So what can you do with this? So, for example, you can use it as a way of investigating the Swampland conjecture, ADS Swampland conjecture, which says there are no stable non susy ADS backgrounds. So people knew about uh, non susy backgrounds uh, that were stable to the consistent truncation modes, and from this you can find that they're actually unstable to some higher kaluza klein modes, which seems a little unlike, uh, a priori might be a bit of a surprise, but that's what happens. But there are other cases which seem to be actually completely perturbatively stable. That doesn't violate this, it just means the instability has to be non-perturbative. And furthermore, you can even find spaces where there's a conformal manifold, there seems to be a conformal manifold, there seems to be a moduli space of non susy perturbative stable vacua. From this full spectrum, you can calculate all the conformal dimensions in the holographic dual, and that can give you information about things like the topology of the conformal manifold. You can go beyond, you can try and think about cubic interactions, you can ask about consistent truncations with less supersymmetry, you can ask about SUSY breaking deformations, and so on. So I think this area is something where there's many new possibilities. I think we have new techniques here for thinking about what these spectra are. Okay, so in the last part, I want to talk about um, 
go on to talk about uh, 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 holography, and I want to talk about, in particular, a very old problem, which is what are the n equal one marginal deformations of n equal four? So. The marginal deformations are the superpotential deformations, and they're parameterized by two parameters. And you can ask, what's the gravity dual? And for the case where this parameter is turned off, that's the beta deformation, and we know very well that there's a beautiful paper by Luna Maldacena that finds the, the gravity dual. If you have both parameters turned on, you have no isometries. It's an extremely difficult problem. It's as hard, essentially, as finding Calabi-Yau matrix. But there's a tour de force calculation that goes to second or third order and, and shows that... Uh, in fact, sees the obstruction that, you would, that, that uh, shows you you only really have these two parameters. So the question is, um, can we find the supergravity dual of this? And in particular, much of the field theory is very simple. It only depends on holomorphic structure. So is there some generic supergravity analog of the fact that there's holomorphic structure here? And can we understand the dual geometry for deformations beyond, basically beyond the classic calabi examples, things that are much more fluxy? So I might be interested in these marginal deformations, not just for S5, but for other sazaki einstein manifolds. So we use the same formalism. So the invariant tensors now that define the supersymmetric background to ADS with arbitrary fluxes, there are two of them. There's one of them, K, which naturally, from the point of view of the five-dimensional theory, lives in vector multiplets. There's an X, which lives in hypermultiplets. The K is some element of the generalized tangent space. I'm in type 2B, so I have vectors in two forms. The X lives in some adjoint bundle. And just for now, just notice it has a leading piece, which looks like one forms, and then a bit that looks like three forms. What about the differential conditions? So again, we have singlet intrinsic torsion. That's what I told you the theorem said. And what happens is that there are F terms. And again, the generalized tangent space decomposes now into three subbundles. The C plus one has to be involutive. There are D terms, which are again moment maps for the generalized diffeomorphisms. They're now not zero, but they get related to K. So this is that cubic invariant I said interested in E6. We're in E6. So for each generalized diffeomorphism, you get some answer which depends on K. This is the singlet torsion appearing here. This would be zero if the torsion was zero. And then there are some R charges. So the K, you can take the generalized derivative along K, and that's the U1R symmetry of the dual field theory. And X has charge 3 and K has charge 0. The fact X has charge 3 makes you wonder if it corresponds to the superpotential somehow, and that's where we'll go. Okay, so let me just give you, show you, though it probably doesn't mean very much, that you can think of Sasaki Einstein in this case. So yeah, Sasaki Einstein is defined by a one form sigma, a holomorphic two form omega, and a real two form psi uh, omega, and psi is the vector that's dual to the. Uh, dual to sigma. So you can write down some object here, and the leading term in X is a three form. This is some adjoint action, don't worry too much. This is capturing something like the Cauchy-Riemann structure. That's a complex structure on an odd dimensional manifold. This is capturing a contact structure. Now in this formulation, you get a universal form for the central charge, which just comes from the cubic invariant. You can think of that as, again, from the gauge supergravity point of view from five dimensions. You also get uh, a gravity dual of a lovely uh, conformal field theory result. The conformal field theory result says that all marginal deformations are in the superpotential, and they are exactly marginal unless there's a global symmetry. That follows from this moment map structure. But what about the um, missing? Uh, what about the missing deformed solutions? So, again, we want to try and think about this GIT picture. So. Here, I've actually drawn the moment map to zero, but remember, we have to solve the moment map as something related to K, but let's leave that for a moment. So it's hard to find the solutions here, but it may be possible to find the solutions here and argue that it's stable, and so that's capturing much of the information. So this is like what happens in a calabi -Yau. You can't find a calabi -Yau metric, but you might well be able to find a Kähler metric in the same Kähler class. And then you know from the existence proof that there will be a calabi -Yau metric. So how do we go to this slightly relaxed thing? Well, we want to relax the moment map condition. So we can define the analog of exceptional of Sasaki. There's Sasaki Einstein and Sasaki. So let's define exceptional Sasaki as just relaxing the D-term condition, relaxing the moment map. And then these orbits are going to be orbits that are, gen that are, generalized, that are generated by the generalized diffeomorphism. So we need to complexify the generalized diffeomorphisms. And the idea is that they're going to intersect on the moment map on the background that we want. Now, physically, 
you can argue it's this orbit which captures the superpotential of the dual field theory. And you can think about it of a couple of different ways. So one is if you're deforming around a conformal point, if you deform x by the lead derivative of something, that actually goes into a long vector multiplet. So that means it's like deforming the Kähler potential. From another point of view, you can write down the supersymmetry conditions for a supersymmetric domain wall, which give you the, which should give you the flow of the, of the theory. And what happens is that x flows, so the prime means the dependence on the, on the direction in the domain wall, but it flows by something which is a generalized diffeomorphism, a generalized lead derivative. So in the class, it doesn't change. So this is the sort of reflecting the non-renormalization of the superpotential. So, for any Sasaki-Einstein background, we can actually find an explicit solution that satisfies the Sasaki conditions. So, uh, exceptional Sasaki conditions. So, choose a function. So, take a Sasaki-Einstein manifold. Its cone over it is a calabi -Yau. Choose a function on that calabi that has charge 3 under the read vector, under the U and R charge. That's saying that it has going to be uh, marginal. Keep the K just as for the, as for the Sasaki Einstein, but deform X so now it has a one form bit that depends on the exterior derivative of V, of F, and it has some other bits. These are two forms, these are some functions, which in general, uh, these things have to be linear in F, these things have to be quadratic in F. So this gives a very complicated deformed metric, axion and axion dilaton and fluxes. Um, it, uh, it's solving um, uh, three quarters of the equations of the supersymmetry that you want to. You can do it for any marginal deformation. And for S5, you can check that this matches to second order the calculation of Aharoni et al. It also has the same discrete symmetries as the, as the deformation of the superpotential. If you take the particular uh, beta deformation you can sh on S5, you can show that this is exactly a generalized diffeomorphism transformation of the lunar Maldacena solution, as I, so it is indeed on the right orbit. So, you can then use general properties of moment maps. Now, really, everything is, is infinite dimensional here, so that's a little fishy, but let's just assume that we can use the ordinary properties of moment maps. Um, and that will say that this solution, so here's the Sasaki Einstein point, here's the solutions that we have. In a neighborhood, uh, you can argue then that in an open neighborhood of the Sasaki Einstein point, these will all flow onto the moment, onto the right moment map. To do that, you need two things. One is actually an assumption that you don't find a different R symmetry when you hit the, hit the moment map. That's saying that uh, you don't find some new symmetry when you get to the fixed point. Um, that means you can do the, the moment maps using um, some generalized diffeomorphism group, which is the one that preserves K. And then uh, you also need to use some properties of the, of the moment map to say that these stable points form an open set. Now, what you'd really like to do, and this is something that uh, we're doing, is to try and understand what the corresponding Mont-Jampere type equation is for what this, for your solving here. That's what you would solve if you were doing the an analogous calabi problem. Okay, so let's assume that we have a solution, and let's see if it makes sense. So we could try and count, count the number of chiral operators in this background, so the single trace mesonic, mesonic operators, and it turns out that they correspond to just deformations of this C+. Uh, again, there's a cohomology that for this C+, and this cohomology is independent of the particular X you choose in the class. So this is, again, being determined just by this class of X, so just by the superpotential. So it's only depending on the holomorphic data. So in particular, we can calculate it not at the actual solution, but at the, the case where we solve the weaker conditions. If you do that for the Sasaki Einstein case, you get a particular cohomology called the transverse de Bow cohomology. If you do it here, if you make the assumption that DF is nowhere vanishing, no, that excludes beta deformations or the YPQs, that gives you a new cohomology, which Ed called the, the eta cohomology, and you can calculate this cohomology using transverse de Bow. So we can calculate the uh, set of chiral operators for any marginally, for marginally deformed uh, backgrounds of any Sasaki Einstein, provided this is nowhere vanishing. And what you find is a universal result. So let's write down the Hilbert series that counts the number of chirals with a particular R charge. You find that it's basically related to the single trace index, shifted by something. 
So we can do this for the, let's do some examples for the regular Sasaki Einstein. So this is the general set of uh, Karls that you get for a, for a generic marginal deformation. Um, and actually this was calculated in the mass literature because these things correspond to something called the cyclic homology on the corresponding quiver with superpotential, and indeed we match. For T11, you can do the calculation, then we just checked it from the field theory, we match up to level seven, and here's, just for the sake of it, some del pezzo six, and you can again get a particular prediction. Okay. So, I think this is an interesting way forward because we now have something in the supergravity that's basically capturing the holomorphic information. And the formalism I've given, although I talked about it in type 2b, is equally applicable to M-theory. So you can start asking, can you use it to think about Maldacena Nunes or BBBW solutions and so on? Can we count the chiral degrees of chiral deformations there too? You can also do it for 3D N equal 2 theories that correspond to deformations of Sasaki Einstein 7. And from the talk yesterday, we see something very similar, that we're arguing for the existence of solutions. Uh, there it was in, uh, in uh, James Sparks' talk, so there it was in dimensions larger than 7, which we can't deal with here, but if we use some of these extensions, maybe we can make a relation to the, what's going on with the spindle story. And then also you, can, you would expect that this complex is somehow going to capture the superconformal index. And indeed, you can show that that's the case both in, in the examples that we're talking about. So in fact, you can calculate the superconformal index by some localization of this complex on the internal space M. And in particular, you would expect that this class should only depend really on the holomorphic structure of the probe geometry, because that's, what, well, that's, what's, in, that's what's determining the field theory. So it's actually something that we may be able to, uh, we may not be able to prove that solutions exist, but we may be able to write down these structures uh, relatively straightforwardly. And then, as a more general picture, there's this relationship between this moment map and GIT picture. And I told you that this motion in the generalized uh, uh, Lie derivative direction corresponds to some, you can think of it as being like um, domain wall flow, you can think a bit about renormalization group flow. Um, and so, um, the, uh, sorry, I'm doing the second one here. So the, the, there's a notion here on kähler einstein manifolds of what's called case stability. That's to do with the existence of, of, of the backgrounds. You can apply it to Sasaki-Einstein. You might try and extend those ideas to this situation. And in particular, the existence of being uh, stable or not is the same as the question of whether it flows to some non-trivial uh, fixed point in the, in the IR or not. And then finally, I'll just mention that you can also use this picture to write down a, a general dual of A maximization and F maximization that applies to uh, generic backgrounds with fluxes. Okay, so let me just briefly summarize. So I hope I've shown you that by using exceptional generalized geometry, you can actually get some new results for flux backgrounds. In particular, we can calculate moduli, but what's missing there is we need more examples, but maybe this stability analysis is going to start helping us do that. We can map out the landscape of consistent truncations. There's a powerful new tool which does Kaluza-Klein spectroscopy, and then we have this new way of thinking about the holomorphic structures in holography, and maybe we don't need the full supergravity background, but we can read off a lot of things by a, a weaker structure. So thank you. I'll stop there. Any questions? Comments? Hey, thanks for the nice talk. I was just wondering if you could say some words about what's being uh, maximized over in your proposed dual for A or F maximization. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch it. The aim, the yes, uh, if you could say some words on what's being maximized over in your proposed A or F maximization duals. Yeah, so, um, so roughly speaking, what happens is that when you have these uh, moment maps, there's actually um, a stratification of the solutions, which is called the Kerman stratification. Um, and 
Actually, the backgrounds we want, because the moment map is non-zero, they're strictly speaking the unstable points if you're doing the full generalized diffeomorphisms. So, rough, essentially, by thinking about that stratification, you can find a way of doing the exact analog of what the A or F maximization is. And you see in particular the condition that A maximization has an assumption that you don't have any new symmetries appear in the infrared. And that's related to the stratification picture. Yep. Uh, thanks for the, such a nice summary. Uh, I just want to get a sense about the, how big the space of such solutions are by asking a specific case. Let's say, for example, I'm interested in 4D n equal to 2 supersymmetric theories with Minkowski backgrounds. Uh, so we know we can get it using Calabia and this and that. How bigger a space will we get using these exceptional generalized geometries? So, uh, I guess there's two questions. I guess you're not asking about how big are the moduli spaces, but actually the space of all, all solutions. Yeah, no, I want to see what are we missing if we just studied Calabria. So, um, I find that a hard question to answer because we don't, it, the difficulty is how we construct these things with the sources. So, uh, we don't have lots of examples with the sources. If you look at the moduli spaces, then you can get both much larger moduli spaces and much smaller moduli spaces. So, I'm not sure I'm answering your question very well, but I, I'm not sure. So, so, do we have any concrete examples other than Calabia with 4D and equal to Minkowski space in this generalized exceptional geometry? Yes. Yeah, so, 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 there is in the sense that there are, the, um, from the past, people have looked at solutions with sources. If you put sources in, then there's various possibilities you can do that are based on Granja Polchinski and so on, right? So, of those classes, there's many things. Um, the next step is to try and understand if we can use the stability to maybe enlarge that class. So I think actually, as it stands at the moment, it's more useful for the ADS background. I see. Thank yeah. you. Um, I have a question regarding like smoothness of these solutions. Are there known singular solutions, and do, do you know what kind of singularities they have? Like in Calabayas, it's a pretty important. So again, issue. I think um, this is all the question of putting in the sources. So um, you can. There are some solutions where you try and smooth out the sources. Um, I'm not uh, so. Um, as stands, for example, that G2 example I gave you, it doesn't have nice sources. You would have singularities there. So um, those, as to Cumran's question, that's something that I don't have a huge amount to say about. 